Okay, now we're back, and this is where, okay, so basically, and the reason why we took a break is because there's a couple of things we're going to talk about with each of these. But the main thing is, with this, when we, we talk about demand curve standardizing, the idea here is that you can really adjust everything we're talking about. These are all adjustable, and what you're doing basically the entire time with any kind of, uh, any, uh, look at that E... All right, there we go. Better. With any kind of uh, any any good, any business, anything that's happening, the more that we adjust these items here, the easier and the more control you have over. Let me go. That was the wrong one. This way, the more control you have over your actual demand curve, because the less important price becomes. Because we could take each of these items here that uh, that we've got right here: taste, income, in expectations, goods, related. Um, related goods and size of the market, and, and a, or a combination, or anything outside of that, or anything that happens. You know, there's thousands of different variables, and we could plot them all on our graph over here. We could put put each of those up here, but to make it easier, we just include price and quantity, and uh, it's just two factors, two variables uh, on a y and an x. We could add a z, you know, that would come right out at you, and we could we could put all those other variables on here. But to make it easier, we 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 clean it up and we just compare price and quantity. So. This also with the business is what they're worried about, you know, their price, their revenue. Uh, it's usually their top concern. So that's why it's one of the items that we focus on. Hopefully, you guys, uh, this page, this all makes sense, right? We went over this. That all makes sense. Okay, because this should be our last episode talking about the uh, these uh, these curves. Okay, so when we come to tastes and preferences up here, this is basically what people are wanting, what they're preferring. It could there's so many variables here. What's happening socially, culturally, a, a big movie, uh, maybe there's a music or a certain music group or something like that. There's all sorts of things that affect this, but you can adjust any of these. That's the big lesson here. You can adjust all of these variables and any other variable to, to move our demand curve. So we can adjust taste and preferences. With income, this is gonna come this relates to how much income the people have and this also brings us to this idea of disposable income, which uh we'll cover here because this brings us to, as far as if we look at normally what we've been doing this entire time is we've been putting price up here, right? Well in this case we're gonna put income. So this is going to be along our y-axis is going to be the income of the people, and then here's going to be the quantity. For a normal good, the higher up income we go, the more quantity that they will demand, right? So the more money you make, the more what, what we have disposable income. That's a big term that people throw around a lot. And they have more money to buy movies, more money to buy DVDs, more money to buy iPods or whatever, more money to buy, uh, you know, um, clothes or TVs or whatever um, goods that we're looking at, generally speaking, for a normal good, the higher, the more income they have, the more income people have, the more they will buy. However, there is a certain type of good that um, there are inferior goods, and we've talked about this elsewhere, but I'll write it out again. Um, when we talk about inferior goods, these are goods that as the income rises, the and this has been on a lot of the tests, understanding how this, this graph looks. But what this means, basically, is as the income goes up, the consumption is decreased. Okay? So here's how that, that would look. And this is something that uh, has been known to pop up on those tests. So it looks something like this. That's how that graph looks. And along this line here, this imaginary line here right through the middle, this is the point at which this really kicks in. So an example of this would be, you may think, what would you buy less of when you make more money? Well, think about it in your own personal life or something you've heard of. What do you buy net when, what do people buy when they're struggling that they stop buying or they buy less of when they're not struggling financially? So things like bus tickets or generic uh, food or generic clothes, like generic cereal. So let's say you're buying generic cereal and then you get a raise, then you get a promotion or things pick back up in your business or something happens. And then we hit this point right here, and then suddenly you buy less and less and less of that good. And then you go and you buy the full, you know, the, the name brand. So this is kind of is the opposite of conspicuous consumption. So here's what we see. with This is something to, um, important to consider when we talk about our goods, and I want to make sure we covered that. Now let's get back to uh, income in general, though. This will affect, this does affect our demand curve. Expectations. Expectations pretty interesting. 
when we talk about expectation, this can relate to they expect to make uh, they expect the price of the product to go up or down. Like when a new iPod or iPad, iPad comes out, the old one. Uh, a lot of the sales, like when they broke into that kid's house, when Steve Jobs ordered that uh, that uh, the, that kid's house to be raided, when he had that iPhone four. Uh, this was a while ago. But what happened, their argument was that the Apple stock suffered because when people knew that there was a new one coming out, there were the, the demand for, and there was actually a demand, not just the quantity demanded, it just plummeted because they uh, were expecting the price to go down for the old one, which was the current one at the time, and the new one was coming out. Also, expectations of their income. This is of your co- your consumer's income to go up, like with medical school, stu- medical school students or college students. If they expect a change in their income in the future, that can also affect our demand. Goods related. Now, we have substitutes and complements. This is, uh, let's go back to our graph here. Um, let me erase this, and we'll put, we'll go back to our standard price and quantity. So we'll get rid of that. We'll go back with price and quantity. So uh, generally, what, what's gonna if you look at like uh, the the price of Coke or Pepsi, Coke and Pepsi are good examples. So let's say uh, Coke um, Coke's price goes up. Okay, so their price goes up. They have an increase from P1 to P2. They're gonna have a change. Uh, and their quantity demanded. But then if we looked at Pepsi's graph, so this would be Coke's graph, but then if we look at, let's say Pepsi is in red, uh, Pepsi's in red, we're going to see, let's say their demand curve was initially here, we're going to see the actual demand curve generally poke out. So the demand curve is actually going to shift. It's not just going to be a movement along the curve, but the demand is actually going to increase. So they have kind of an inverse relationship with, um, like, there's things like perfect substitutes and things like that, where you can buy one thing and it's exactly the replica of the other. Coke and Pepsi are not even perfect substitutes because there are some people that uh, will argue that they get a different benefit from Coke, one or the other. But that's just an example. Then there's compliments, things that go together, like TVs and um like a new house and a TV, for example. So, if there's a huge change in the, um, in the, uh, well, that wouldn't even be that, that would be kind of an inverse or one-way compliment because if there's a large change in the price of TVs, it's not like that's generally going to affect the price or the demand of houses. But with houses, that could have a uh, that will have generally a much bigger impact on the pri- on the cost of TVs. So there's things like that, which we'll talk more about these. Not so much because it's more specific towards the kind of the academic approach which is what we'll be in so which what we're kind of moving away from after this episode so that's here the substitutes and complements now the size of the market didn't mean to do that this can actually be manipulated uh pretty easily and adjusted where um we've talked about we're going to go over a lot of examples over this where you take your your average market and you can actually expand double triple your market and people don't even know uh, competitors don't even know. Another thing, by the way, with substitutes and complements, one of the things we want to do is not have the only. When we have substitutes, that's where the consumer believes that one good is just as uh, is equivalent to the other. We want to get rid of that perception. There's ways that we can coming back to our uh, our graph here. There are ways that you can change that uh, that substitute mindset where you get rid of substitutes. Where that's no longer there's no one that can there, there's no the perception uh, there's not a perceived uh, substitute. There's nowhere where they can get the same benefits. So there's ways to deal with that. And uh, there should be a situation where, and we're going to go over a lot of examples in this, where the only time you have substitutes is on purpose. Um, but this all does affect our, our demand curve. Now, size of the market, you know, for example, with mattresses, someone selling mattresses, how do you um, work with a diet group and, um, uh, you know, double, triple, quadruple your business with a diet group? When you do research and you find that, uh, the average American has 20 to 30 pounds. This is in America. The average American has 20 to 30 pounds of excess food in their um, intestines, and the proper respiration during sleep can reduce that by half. So just by changing the way you sleep, you can reduce your, you know, lose about 10 to 15 pounds. Now suddenly it opens up a whole new market. So you can actually adjust the size pretty easily. And how many mattress wholesalers and mattress retailers are working with diet groups and diet stores and uh, diet dietitians and nutritionists? Not very many, not any at the time that we were doing that. And um, that's one example. So the size is a huge issue because you can work with just adjusting the size, and that could take this demand curve and blast it way out where there's a whole new market. And in that market, 
there is essentially no substitute because there's nobody that's providing that education or that uh, usage, that utility for that product. So there's other ways of manipulating this and uh, moving them back and forth and really adjusting you know, one, adjusting all. And one of the main reasons we went over all the supply and demand stuff is because of a lot, of, to a lot of the academic people, this needs to be explained to them. And so now that it's up, we'll just send them you know, this and have them look at it because this needs to be explained to them again and again and again. They have to be like beat over the head with it before they understand that you can mathematically adjust any one of these, all of these, and completely eliminate uh, nearly all, and in many cases, all elasticity in any business. Okay, so that covers that. One other thing we got to cover here um, with uh, goods. So generally speaking, let me see what we've got here. Uh, okay, so the size of the market, we talked about that. Goods related. So, okay, so let's go over Veblen. Va um, this was uh, Thorstein Veblen. This is one of our terms that we were going to talk about. Thorstein Veblen. Well, I should probably spell that neatly since it's a bizarre name. That's an E I N. Thorstein Veblen. V E B V E B L E N. These are also what's called positional goods. So this is a interesting thing. We'll do this in blue. This is where usually as the price increases, the quantity decreases, right? So this is a typical demand curve, right? It looks something like that. We've talked about this a lot, right? Let me erase these parts over here. So a typical demand curve looks something like uh, like this over here. Well, with a Veblen good or a positional good, what he found, he was the first uh, economist credited with finding that sometimes when the price goes up, the quantity increases, the quantity demanded uh, increases. And this is where it's kind of like that snob factor. This would be like um, a Rolls Royce or some sort of good like that. So this curve looks something like this. So it's kind of the opposite, somewhat of a uh, inferior good. Well, that's a terrible curve. Let me do that again. It looks more like uh, that. And I don't even know if this part right here is that flat, but we'll just... Uh, you guys get the idea. So we come through here, and this is our imaginary uh, point here, this imaginary line. This is kind of the the glam, the glamour factor, the uh, conspicuous consumption factor. So a good goes up, and this line would probably be a little more like that too, but... Um, a good is going up in price less and less, then suddenly something happens, and as the price increases, it becomes more attractive. So like a Rolls Royce or an Apple, for example. I keep using Apple because they're such a great example of so many things. But it becomes more glamorous, more attractive, and more attractive. Eventually, if you raise the price like $20 billion, you know, so it's, there is some limit. But there is this interesting part right here. This is really our main focus with a lot of what we do. We have... Um, 19 in our research we've identified 19 different Veblen factors and a good question to ask yourself with any company that you work with is what are they doing right now to uh, take advantage of this right here to to stimulate to be the catalyst for this kind of a relationship this kind of a activity and almost nobody's doing anything how do you raise your price and have have it become a part of the attraction. There are definite ways to do that. We've isolated some. We're going to talk about them later. But for right now, I just want you to know that this curve does exist, and it's part of what's called the positional goods. And uh, this is a special type of good. So as the price increases, quantity demand increases. Okay, I think we've got a lot of that. Uh, a lot of that covered. One thing I do want to. One final item I want to cover here, because we've been talking a lot about the demand curve, and we did get a few questions about the supply curve and the elasticity there. So let's go back here. This should be the last thing. I'll check one last time when we're done. Let's say this is our demand curve, D1. We have this down here, D1. It's already labeled. And then we have, we'll do this in blue, our supply curve, right? S, wow. Okay, S1. Okay, with our supply curve, if you remember our formula, a quick way of doing that, we're going to have the same formula for uh, determining... Um, our uh, elasticity. So if you ever want a quick way of knowing this, I'll put it down here. We start with price, but in this case, instead of quantity demanded, just like it is uh, like it is for um, uh, the elasticity of demand, it's quantity supplied. Okay? Times, 
And then we have the same thing. If you ever want to know a quick way of doing this, just inverse this. So the QS is at the top, quantity supplied is at the top, price is at the bottom. Times quantity supplied over price. Okay, but that's not it, right? Because we have to measure the change. So that's it. This is it, our delta, our change. So that's the formula for um, calculating uh, the, the, the elasticity of supply. Or that's one version. Another version is we just add percents because sometimes we only have percents, right? So in that case, this is another version of that same formula, just like with elasticity. So with the percent signs, we just add the percent signs here, percent of, uh, percent of the change in quantity supplied over the percent of change in price, and that gives us our quantity supplied. Now, remember, we had five different types of, uh, um, I'll go back and pull them up so they're here. We had five different types of elasticity, right? Here with demand, we had perfectly inelastic, inelastic, unitary elastic, unitary, I did that last time too, unitary elasticity, elastic, and then perfectly elastic, five. So let's start with these two extremes. Let's see what they look like on our supply curve. And then we'll go in because we have five different uh, variables with our supply curve as well. So here, if we start with, if we look at our supply curve here, and uh, this is going to be, if it's perfectly, well, I'll, I'll do it this way. Why don't I erase this, and we'll make it uh, easier. So let's clear that up, and let's take a look right now. Okay, so here's our supply curve. Now, well, we already know from our supply curve that only one part is going to touch, generally, only one part is going to touch the X and Y. Remember with our demand curve, both parts touch the X and Y usually. But here, this is the only part that's going to touch, right, because that part's going off into outer space. Not really, but generally it's not going to come into anywhere near our x or our y axis. So this is the this is the part of the line that we're we're concerned with right here. Where this what this line does is going to tell us what where we're at. So if the line comes here, if it connects here through our y axis, okay, anywhere along this y axis, anywhere along here, okay, it is elastic. Okay? If it connects right here and the exact um, the exact origin at zero, it's unitary. Right. This is that means here. Uh, this is one for one. Any change in quantity demanded or any or any change in price is an equal change in supply. If it connects down here on our x-axis anywhere down here, this is going to be inelastic. Okay. Makes sense. Okay. Now our two extremes are going to be completely horizontal or completely vertical. Okay, if it's completely horizontal, what's it going to be? 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 Okay, perfectly elastic, right? What the hell was that? Okay, perfectly elastic. If it's down here, if it's uh, hitting our X and it's perfectly um, vertical, this is perfectly inelastic. Okay, these are two extremes. Here, no matter what change in price, it makes no difference to this uh, amount supplied, quantity supplied, and here, uh, the exact opposite. So we've got all five of our points, right? Perfectly inelastic, elastic, unitary elastic, unitary, <laughs> unitary elasticity, um, inelastic, and then perfectly inelastic. Make sense? Okay, I think that covers just about everything on our items here. Okay, this all these uh, items should make sense. We've covered these in the last few. The five types of uh, um, okay, the the Veblen factors. That should be an E. I don't know who did that. <laughs> Veblen factors, quantity demand and quantity supplied are um, our uh, elasticity curves. Demand does not equal price. The two main uh, 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 elasticity formulas, both for supply and demand. And now we're going to talk about, this is what we're going to really cover um, in the next few items here, is because the, the whole idea of taking what we're doing and adjusting it so where we move the demand either to the right or the left, that's where people go bonkers and, you know, just really get, uh, I really hear a lot of craziness about that, about moving the demand. But that's the one of the main reasons why we're learning this stuff. Multiple uh, factors uh, with um, having a single point of those uh, those uh, de determinants of demand, adjusting any one of them or adjusting all of them at the same time. Uh, changing demand factors, example of singular, examples of singular uh, factor demand shifts. We went over all that. Hopefully that... Uh, is all clear and all makes sense. And then we've got other items. This will be the last page I'll go over because positional goods, this is just like the uh, Veblen curves. Okay, they got it spelled right there. 
Good job. HK is actually the one who came up with the uh, the dad formula, by the way. This is, comes down to dialogue, audience, dialogue, audience, delivery. These are the main items when we talk about our determinants of demand, how to adjust any of them. It's any one of these items can do that. We usually start with dialogue because it's the most important. We're going to cover that more. But he's also the one who's going to get in trouble. Here he got it right, but before, V-E-B-L-I-N, unbelievable. And that's conspicuous consumption, buying a fancy Mercedes, even though I personally have driven them, and I think they're a lot rougher riding than even a standard Ford. Definitely worse riding than a Cadillac, but they cost so much more, and that immediately adds some appeal to it. Inferior goods, positional goods, equilibrium, a change in demand. Okay, hopefully this all makes sense. I'm going to flip through here. Okay, we covered all this. And I think that covers just about everything. Okay, so in the next uh, the next uh, series, we will refer to these items here, just so that they all make sense and they're all clear. We're gonna we're gonna refer back to this, but you guys should be clear on all this. Make sure if you have any uh, any questions or anything, let us know. And also, you can go back and review those episodes as many times as you want. All right, guys, I think that does it. In the next episode, we're really gonna get to. Um, the specifics of how to put this in place and how to enter the mode of business badassery. All right, guys, we'll talk soon. Thanks. Take care. Bye.